I hope you're well. I'm glad to be able to give this series of talks on uh, a case for Christianity. Uh, uh, apologetics or Christian evidences is an interest of mine, and so learning about these things and talking about them is something that I like to do. Uh, I don't consider myself to be an expert, uh, but I do like talking about these things, and so it's an enjoyable thing uh, for me, and I hope to be able to share some of the things that I've learned. Uh, I've had to have been uh, somewhat selective here. I know that there's a lot more that could be said about some of these things. And so uh, if you have comments or you want to talk about these things or have questions or anything like that, feel free to contact me, and, and I'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, perhaps I should also mention that originally these uh, presentations were given within services, but uh, to add the slides, it seemed best to re-record them. Well, by way of introduction, do Christianity and science conflict? I think that there are uh, some in our society that think that they do and kind of see a, a culture war or a battle taking place with kind of science and rationality and reason over on one side and kind of religion over on the other side, especially Christianity. I think sometimes people see it that way. Uh, but I don't really think that's true. I, I don't think there really is any conflict between uh, Christianity and science. We could note that you know, in times past, there were many great scientists who were uh, religious people, like uh, Isaac Newton, certainly one of the, the greatest scientists of all time, or Gregor Mendel, uh, founder of genetics, uh, Pasteur, known for uh, uh, his uh, vaccine for rabies and also for showing that, uh, you know, microorganisms do not emerge spontaneously. I wonder what he would think of the idea that life emerged spontaneously on uh, the earth or something like that. And uh, probably many of these great scientists also believed that uh, God created. Plus, we could note that there's a lot of agreement between the Bible and science. For example, the idea that the universe had a beginning. Science tells us that, and the scriptures tell us that as well. Or that the earth hangs in space. Or that the stars are countless. And so there's agreement, much agreement, between the Bible and science. And then also, let's suppose that scientists uh, or scientists make discoveries about uh, space travel or a cure for cancer. That would certainly be a wonderful thing. Or how to power a car on water. I understand there are some people working on that. You know, there wouldn't be any conflict between those discoveries and Christianity. And so certainly I don't see any conflict there. It appears then that Really, the perceived conflict between Christianity and science, I think, pertains to the theory of evolution, which I'm just going to call evolution. And uh, incidentally, you may know that the, the notion of a theory uh, doesn't necessarily mean anything like, you know, it's more speculative or something like that. In science, generally, a theory is just a, a framework for organizing information and in the way we think about it. And uh, uh, the Bible and evolution certainly do conflict. Uh, if by evolution one means evolution from a single cell to all living things. That didn't really trouble me, though, because uh, I think that there is also a conflict between science and evolution, that evolution is not really supported by science. And so, in a sense, we could say that Christianity and science are kind of allies united in their common opposition to uh, evolution. Let me give you a few quotes on this. And so... Darwin's general theory that all life on Earth had originated and evolved by a gradual successive accumulation of fortuitous mutations is still, as it was in Darwin's time, a highly speculative hypothesis entirely without direct factual support and very far from the self-evident axiom some of its more aggressive advocates would have us believe. Or this one here, modern scientific studies have not made evolution more believable, they have made it less believable. And then this here, this I think is one of my new favorite quotes. The Darwinian mechanism of mutation natural selection is wrong. It's not just implausible. It's not just unlikely. It is absolutely dead wrong. It is not just a false axiom. It is an unsupported and discredited hypothesis which can be confidently rejected. And I would certainly agree with that. Really, I think that evolutionists are kind of confronted with a dilemma uh, right now. Because uh, as science progresses, it seems to me that more and more evidence is suggesting that evolution is not correct. But the obvious alternative is creation. And many evolutionists regard creation, because it involves the supernatural, as being outside of science. 
Let me read you this very well-known uh, quote here by Lewontin. Uh, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of life, of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how mystifying to the un uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, he says. And so you might say that they have an ideology. They have a philosophical perspective that precludes considering creation or things of the supernatural. Well, with that as an introduction, let me get into the first of uh, these talks that I hope to give. Design demands a designer. And I'd like to note that in this talk, as well as in the other ones, I benefited from many sources, some of them indicated right there. I don't necessarily agree with everything that, uh, that any of these sources might have to say, but certainly they were very helpful. So to begin, let me give you some questions to think about, and I hope that I'll address these questions as I go on. Why do some people suggest that our universe is only one of many? Is the Earth an ordinary planet? Is a single cell simple? With which part of evolutionary theory do creationists agree? And if a million monkeys type for a million years, could they type the works of Shakespeare? To begin, let me give you some uh, uh, pictures here. I think uh, many, if not all, of these are from NASA. I presume many were taken by the, the Hubble Space Telescope, and certainly they are very uh, uh, remarkable and, and uh, beautiful, I think, as well. And so there's one. Here's a, another one, the Ring Nebula, I believe this is. There's Saturn, of course, that we recognize. And there's a Ring Galaxy. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think that's Andromeda. The reason it looks kind of fiery like that is because, uh, if I remember, that's an infrared photo. And there's a partial eclipse. All right. so. It seems to have become more and more apparent that the universe is finely tuned, finely tuned. Here are some quotes from that particular website there. Dr. Paul Davies, noted author and professor of theoretical physics at Adelaide University, the really amazing thing is not that life on Earth is balanced on a knife edge, but that the entire universe is balanced on a knife edge and would be total chaos if any of the natural constants were off even slightly. I think some of those constants include things like, uh, uh, if I remember, the uh, charge on the electron, the charge on the proton, something about the strong nuclear force, and uh, other ones as well. Then this one here by Hoyle, uh, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a superintendent has monkeyed with the physics, as well as chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Or I especially like this one. Michael Turner, the widely quoted astrophysicist at the University of Chicago and Fermilab, describes the fine-tuning of the universe with a simile. The precision is as if one could throw a dart across the entire universe and hit a bullseye one millimeter in diameter on the other side. And so I would call that quite remarkable, quite remarkably fine-tuned. Well, to me, that fine-tuning speaks of design. It seems like design would be an obvious explanation for fine-tuning, and yet, of course, not everyone agrees with the idea of design. And so uh, let me give you some quotes here from this particular article. I went ahead and put the title on here as well because I thought that was interesting. Science's Alternative to an Intelligent Creator. You know, people on the, uh, on the evolution side, you might say, uh, often speak of things that pertain to religion and what, what God might do or what God wouldn't have done or things like that. Sometimes an argument might be made, well, God wouldn't have done it this way, so it must have evolved or things like that. And I find that sort of argument kind of interesting because, uh, 
you know, how would how would they necessarily know what God would do? But here, of course, we're not talking about biological evolution, but uh, rather about this idea, the multiverse theory. And so here, as we have noticed, its basic properties are uncannily suited for life. Tweak the laws of physics in just about any way, and in this universe anyway, life as we know it would not exist. Call it a fluke, a mystery, a miracle, or call it the biggest problem in physics. Short of invoking a benevolent creator, many physicists see only one possible explanation. Our universe may be but one of perhaps infinitely many universes in an inconceivably vast multiverse. Most of those universes are barren, but some, like ours, have conditions suitable for life. The idea is controversial. Critics say it doesn't even qualify as a scientific theory because the existence of other universes cannot be proved or disproved. Advocates argue that, like it or not, the multiverse may be the only viable non-religious explanation for what is often called the fine-tuning problem, the baffling observation that the laws of the universe seem custom-tailored to favor the emergence of life. And so to me that almost sounds like people saying, if you don't want a religious explanation, then here's what you need to accept. And that's kind of consistent with what this person says here. If there is no multiverse, where does that leave physicists? One cosmologist, Bernard Carr, replied, if there's only one universe, Carr says, you might have to have a fine tuner. If you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. And so it appears that these are kind of the competing explanations. It's like there's incredible fine tuning in the universe. To me, that would speak of design. But some might say, well, no, I, I don't like the idea of design. What, what other possibilities might there be? And the multiverse would be another explanation. I find that to be not a particularly good explanation. We're in this universe, and, and the notion that there could be infinitely many other, other universes seems to me like a, a way of escaping the, the obvious conclusion of design. Well, of course, the theory of intelligent design doesn't tell us anything about who the designer is, although different people have different ideas about who that is. But I believe I know who the, the designer of the universe is because the scriptures tell us exactly. Let me give you a few verses here. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 45.12, God speaking, I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. Colossians 1.16, the first part of that verse here, speaking of Jesus' role in the creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And then finally, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Well, let's turn from the universe to design of the Earth. Is the Earth an ordinary planet? And there's this principle that I understand called the principle of uh, mediocrity. I think it's sometimes also called the Copernican principle. The idea that, well, you know, the Earth is just, uh, it's just an ordinary planet. It's just a regular planet. There's billions and billions of them. It, it's really nothing special. And, uh, uh, of course, a, a corollary or an idea that goes along with that idea would be, well, uh, if the Earth is an ordinary planet, and those on the evolution, might, or evolution side might say, well, life evolved here, and so if the Earth is an ordinary planet, then life should have evolved on many other planets as well. But if so, then why is it that we have not encountered extraterrestrial life? And there's even a name for that problem called the Fermi Paradox. And so if the Earth is ordinary and life evolved here, people on the evolution side would say, then why is it that it doesn't seem to have evolved in many other places and why have we not had contact from those other places? Well, it seems to me that the solution is that the Earth isn't ordinary. The Earth is actually quite special. The Earth is special and rare, and this is sometimes called the rare Earth hypothesis. And so it seems that the Earth is not an ordinary planet, that it's actually quite rare and uh, could be called a 
Goldilocks planet. You know, in the story about Goldilocks and the three bears, she goes into the house and there are those three bowls of porridge and one of them is too hot and one of them is too cold and one of them is just right. If I recall, the, it's the smallest one that's just right, kind of contrary to the laws of physics there. But anyway, uh, and so uh, that's what I mean by the, gold, the Earth is a Goldilocks planet in the sense that it is just right. And let me give you some of the things that uh, have been put forth as reasons why the Earth is a Goldilocks planet. Here's the one that I think is especially associated with that. The Earth is located in the habitable zone. With regard to the solar system, it's located in that band around the sun where life could exist. You know, if the Earth was a little bit farther out, it would be too cold and life wouldn't exist. Or if it was a little bit closer in, then it would be too hot and life wouldn't exist. But it's located just in that perfect place where it's just right, the habitable zone. Also located in the galactic habitable zone, where uh, it's protected from things like supernovas and things along those lines. The Earth also has water, that is, it has liquid water, which it appears is necessary for life. The Earth has an atmosphere that is suitable for life. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the, the Star Trek series, but, you know, contrary to the way it is for them, where it seems like, you know, every third planet they come to is a class M planet and they can breathe there, you know, it's really not that way. Uh, most planets, uh, you know, are not like the Earth, and they don't have an atmosphere like this. And so the Earth has an atmosphere that is suitable for life. The Earth's relatively fast rotation provides a uniform temperature. And then there are other ones as well. In fact, if I recall, there's about 20 different things that people have said. I believe there's a book uh, about the rare Earth, and then there's also one that I noted earlier, The Privileged Planet, uh, that talks about these things as well. Uh, the tilt, if I recall, that gives uh, temperate seasons. Uh, the large moon that, that uh, uh, helps with regard to the tides. Nearby large planets like Jupiter protect us from comet impacts and things along those lines. And so the Earth is not an ordinary planet. It is actually quite special, quite special and rare, uncommon. But at the same time, it's also not the Garden of Eden. You know, sometimes people, I think, look around the, the world and they see suffering and they see things that are bad and, and things like that. And they think, you know, th this doesn't look like the kind of planet that God would have made. And in a sense, they're exactly right, because this isn't really the planet that God made. God made a paradise. But... This planet now has been corrupted by the effects of sin. You know, uh, often we speak of the spiritual consequences of sin, the fact that it separates people from God, and that, of course, is extremely important. But it's also true that sin has physical consequences as well. And in a later talk, I hope to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Well, let me turn to the design of life. Is a single cell simple? I suppose that there was a time when people thought a cell is just a simple thing. It's just a little kind of sack of protoplasm there. Nothing special. It wouldn't, wouldn't take much to get something like that. But in fact, we know that that is not the case. Shortly after 1950, science advanced to the point where it could determine the shapes and properties of a few of the molecules that make up living organisms. The cumulative results show with piercing clarity that life is based on machines. Machines made of molecules. Mo molecular machines haul cargo from one place in the cell to another along highways made of other molecules, while still others act as cables, ropes, and pulleys to hold the cell in shape. Machines turn cellular switches on and off. Electrical machines allow current to flow through nerves. Manufacturing machines build other molecular machines as well as themselves. Cells swim using machines, copy themselves with machinery, ingest food with machinery. In short, highly sophisticated molecular machines control every cellular pr process. Thus, the details of life are finely calibrated and the machinery of life enormously complex. Now, let me give you another one here. A metaphor by Fred Hoyle has become famous because it vividly conveys the magnitude of the problem that a living organism emerged by chance from a prebiotic soup is about as likely as that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Probably a lot less likely, I'm guessing, even than that. In short, then, life is complicated. And I like this line here right at the very bottom. The more biologists look, the more complexity there seems to be. 
Well, but one might ask, I remember having a person ask me this, what about Miller's experiment? You may recall that experiment where uh, various types of chemicals were put into this apparatus and then a spark was done and they got some uh, amino acids out of that. What about that? Well, you know, amino acids are used by the body, but amino acids are a pretty far step from life. They're not alive. So Behe says here, as with Mary Shelley's fictional Frankenstein, it appeared that electricity coursing through inanimate matter could indeed produce life. It turns out that the successes, although real, paper over a plethora of problems that can only be appreciated when you move beyond the simical, the simple chemical proje production of some of the bare components of life, like amino acids. Or this one here. More than 30 years of experimentation on the origin of life in the fields of chemical and molecular evolution have led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth, rather than to its solution. Well, to me, that seems to speak of design as well. But some might say, well, no, there's alternatives to that. Here's one that I find inter interesting. Directed panspermia. Directed panspermia. The theory that organisms were deliberately transmitted to the Earth by intelligent beings on another planet. We conclude that it is possible that life reached the Earth in this way, but that the scientific evidence is inadequate at the present time to say anything about the probability. I find that interesting that some would think that that is more plausible than the idea that God created. But what makes it even more interesting, I think, is you know who, some of you I'm sure probably do know who this is, that Crick right there, Crick and Orgel there, who is that? That's Francis Crick, one of the discoverers of the double helix structure of DNA, probably one of the most famous scientists in the 20th century. And so if, a, I, I guess you could say, a, a, a scientist as, uh, of his caliber, who's as well known as he, is putting this forth as a, as a possibility, then that suggest to me something about the improbability that it that life could have emerged by chance. Behe says the resulting realization that life was designed by an intelligence is a shock to us in the 20th century who have gotten used to thinking of life as the result of simple natural laws. But other centuries have had their shocks and there's no reason to suppose that we should escape them. Well, let me turn finally to the design of the variety of living things. And so, as we look around the world, of course, there are all sorts of different types of living things. And according to the theory of evolution, those all emerged from a single cell. Here's some, like this owl here, or the lion, a polar bear, a dolphin, or even this beautiful tree here. As you might know, the idea is that of evolution is that everything emerged from a single cell, including plant life and animal life. So according to the theory of evolution, it's not just that we're related to animals, we're related to plants as well. Let me give you a couple of quotes here from Dawkins, very well known for his, uh, his uh, contending for atheism. And so Dawkins says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And so as we look at things, it certainly seems like they've been designed for a purpose. But he says, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. Some of you may be familiar with Paley's argument about the watch, that if you find a watch, you know that there is a watchmaker, that this watch didn't happen by chance. But Dawkins says, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. It's not like a regular watchmaker. Blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences, has no purpose in view. Yet the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design, as if by a master watchmaker, impress us with the illusion of design and planning. So he says, things certainly look as though they were designed with a purpose in mind. But he says that's actually not the case, that that's actually an illusion. Well, the theory of evolution suggests that the variety of living things emerge through a process of random mutation and natural selection. And I think it's important that we kind of separate those and distinguish between them. And so let me try to do that, beginning with natural selection. Natural selection, as you might know, is very much like artificial selection. So for example, let's suppose that 
you're a dog breeder and you decide that you want to breed dogs that will have long fur, well, how would you go about doing that? As you probably know, what you would do is you might look at a litter of dogs and find a particular dog that has especially long fur in that litter and maybe find a dog that has long fur from another litter and breed those two dogs that both have long fur and then maybe out of the puppies that are that are in the litter from those two dogs there would be some that would have even longer fur and you could continue doing that until eventually you get uh, that trait as a kind of a true breeding uh, characteristic for that breed of dog. Well, nature of course can select as well. Let's suppose that uh, there's a, a litter of puppies and it's a cold climate, very cold. Well, it may very well be that the ones that don't have long fur uh, won't survive and they won't live long enough to reproduce. And so if this sort of thing goes on, of course, then you're going to end up with a population of dogs that have long fur because those are the only ones that can survive to be able to reproduce. And if the long fur is something that can be passed on genetically, then you're going to continue to have dogs that have long fur. Well, does that sound controversial? I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem really controversial to me. Not like I'm saying that the idea of natural selection wasn't a really good insight on Darwin's part. I think that it was. But it doesn't sound particularly controversial. And in fact, everyone, evolutionists, creationists, intelligent design theorists, all agree with the idea of natural selection. And they also agree with the idea that new species can emerge through natural selection. That you could get species that you didn't have before, new species coming to ex into uh, existence through natural selection. Now some might say though, wait just a minute. Is that really true? Creationists think that new species can evolve? Absolutely. Most definitely. For example, take a look at these. These are not all of the, of the same species. In fact, they're not even all of the same genus. If I remember correctly, uh, 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 wolves and foxes are of, uh, they're not of the same genus. Uh, wolves and coyotes, I think, are different species. Dingoes, for example, are uh, subspecies of wolves, if I remember. But they're probably all of the same biblical kind. In other words, probably originally there were two canines and those had the variability within their genes to produce all of these different kinds, all of these different varieties that we see here, different species. And so artificial selection or natural selection could produce dogs with long fur, but the change is limited by the genes. I like this quote here by Johnson. The eminent French zoologist Peter Grasset concluded, the fact is that selection gives tangible form to and gathers together all the varieties a genome is capable of producing, but does not constitute an innovative evolutionary process. And then Johnson adds, in other words, the reason that dogs don't become as big as elephants, much less change in elephants, is not that we just haven't been breeding them long enough. Dogs do not have the genetic cap capacity for that degree of change, and they stop getting bigger when the genetic limit is reached. And so changes can occur. Big changes can occur. You know, you look at like a St. Bernard and a Chihuahua. Those are pretty different. But they're still dogs. And their ancestor had the genes necessary to produce St. Bernard's or Chihuahuas. I like this quote here. It is now approximately half a century since the neo-Darwinian synthesis was formulated. A great deal of research has been carried on within the paradigm it defines. Yet the successes of the theory are limited to the minutia of evolution, such as the adaptive change in the coloration of moths, referring to Kettlewell's experiment there probably. While it has remarkably little to say on the questions which, which interest us most, such as how there came to be moths in the first place. Well. So Darwin reasoned that natural selection could select creatures that were more fit. Fitness, of course, has to do with reproduction. And so it doesn't have to do with like how, how strong you are. You know, if you, if you have uh, more children than Arnold Schwarzenegger, then you're more fit than he. You know. But Darwin did not know that the variability in creatures comes from their genes. Now we do know that. And so a single-celled organism doesn't possess the genes for wings 
and hands and flower petals and fins and hearts and brains and bones and eyes. Where did all that genetic information come from to construct things like a wing or an eye or a hand, things like that? Where did that come from? If you look down here at this diagram, it's the same diagram I show in my psychology class, and I don't, I'm not going to take the time to go into detail about this, but as you can see, the eye is quite complex. It's very complex. And not only the eye itself is complex, but then there's pathways that go out of the eye to the occipital lobe here in the back of your brain, and it doesn't even stop there, because some goes to the uh, parietal lobe, and then some goes to the temporal lobe, or some goes from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, and so it's quite a complex process with, um, uh, well, so where did all that genetic information come from? Evolution suggests that it comes from random mutation. And that, not natural selection, the notion that that could come from random mutation, that is the controversial part of evolution. Can complex information really emerge by chance? And note that without variability, natural selection has nothing to select from. In other words, natural selection, we all agree with that, but you have to have the variability from which to select. And that variability, according to the theory of evolution, comes from random mutation. Could that really be true? Could it really come from random mutation? And that is the source of the controversy. Well, let's turn to this then. If a million monkeys type for a million years, could they type the works of Shakespeare? And, and uh, Weicker and Witt say here in their uh, interesting book here, this claim has cast a kind of malignant charm for far too long. Thus, it wasn't until 2002 that enterprising researchers finally set out to test the performance levels of typing monkeys at Plymouth University in England. And so they left a computer with six macaques for a month. And here's what they typed, if, if I wrote it down correctly. That, and that, and that, this, and that, and that. I think there was another screen of S's that you might not have seen go by. Researcher Mike Phillips noted they pressed a lot of S's. Suffice it to say their literary efforts fall a good deal short of the bard. And so it doesn't really look like monkeys would be capable of typing that sort of thing. But of course they only had six monkeys and they only had one month. What if they had more monkeys and they had more time? Would that help? And so how long would it take a hundred billion monkeys to type just the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. You know, we have a, a, a book that has the works of Shakespeare. I think it's about 2,000 pages long. But the prologue uh, to Romeo and Juliet is just a short part. I think it's about 500 letters plus spaces long, less than a page. How long would it take them just to type that little part? Not all the works of Shakespeare, but just that little part. And let's suppose further that they could type a hundred letters per second and they never took a break. How long would that take? Well, if I calculated this correctly, the years would be 27, 26 letters plus a space, to the 500th power, because there's about 500 letters plus spaces, and you have to have the right one in every single position. And so 27 times 27 times 27, and so on 500 times. But, of course, we have to divide that by the fact that we've got 100 billion monkeys. And plus, each monkey can type 100 letters per second, so we have to take that into account. 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours a day, 365 and a quarter days per year. And so if you calculate that out, more than that, actually quite a bit more, but that seems sufficient, so I stopped typing zeros. And so more than that number of years. So it isn't really possible for, the, for monkeys to type the works of Shakespeare. But some might argue, and they would be right. It's like, well, but in that case, you had to have everything exact all at once. What if you could sort of gradually accumulate information? Would that be possible? Well, Richard Dawkins programmed a computer, I understand, to create random variations in a string of letters to try to generate the pre-selected phrase, methinks it is like a weasel. I think it comes from Hamlet. Methinks it is like a weasel. 
How long would it take to do that? And so as I understand, he started out with a random string and then he had the computer replace letters and whenever a letter would be correct, that would be preserved and then the rest of the letters would be altered and then if those would be correct, those would be preserved and so on. How long would it take to get the entire phrase? Methinks it is like a weasel. Only took about 50 generations to achieve that. So that doesn't seem like that would be too difficult. That looks like maybe that could work. Except, you know, Proverbs 18:17 says the one who states his case first seems right until another comes and examines him. And uh, in Dawkins' defense, I understand that he himself noted that in some ways his example is misleading and he simplified things or, or things of that nature. And so I don't want to misrepresent uh, what he's saying. But, you know, there's things about that scenario trying to get the methinks is like a weasel that aren't really like the way evolution would really have to work. Uh, Spetner in his book Not By Chance calculated the, that a more realistic example would take more than 10 billion generations. Not 50. 10 billion generations. Spetner says, one problem with evolution is that the chance of it happening in a reasonable time is too low. Or what amounts to the same thing, it takes too long. When Dawkins speeds up evolution enough, he is glossing over the very problem that makes it impossible. Or this here with regard to the Wistar Symposium. I think it was in the 60s where this symposium was organized uh, to uh, have a discussion between mathematicians who were raising uh, questions or doubts with regard to uh, evolution and biologists. And I like this quote here. A mathematician who claimed that there was insufficient time for the number of mutations apparently needed to make an eye was told by the biologist that his figures must be wrong. Presumably because they say, well, we've got the eye, so it must have happened. The mathematicians, though, were not persuaded that the fault was theirs. That it certainly does look like there isn't enough time to get the number of mutations that would be necessary to make an eye. But it gets even worse. Dawkins programmed favorable mutations. In other words, sometimes the correct letter would come up. But in reality, mutations destroy genetic information rather than creating it. Spetner says here, moreover, there are no examples of mutations that add information to the genome. Dawkins' simulations have nothing to do with orga organic evolution. Or this quote here by Sanford, a geneticist, apart from our ideological commitment to the primary axiom, random mutation and selection, it can very reasonably be argued that random mutations are never good. And so a more realistic picture of the effects of random mutation would be something like this, you know, a bull in a china shop. It breaks things. It doesn't make things better. But one might ask, well, but people on the evolution side sometimes say, well, we can see evolution happening before our eyes and give maybe some examples perhaps like these. What about evolved resistance to pesticides or antibiotics? Let me give you a couple of quotes here. Insect resistance to a pesticide was first reported in 1947 for the housefly, housefly with respect to DDT. Since then, resistance to one or more pesticides has been reported in at least 225 species of insects and other arthropods. The genetic variants required for resistance to the most diverse kinds of pesticides were apparently present in every one of the populations exposed to these man-made compounds. In other words, there were some that already had resistance. And of course, if you kill off all the rest of them, then you're going to have a big population that has resistance. But the resistance was already there. They didn't like evolve something new, you might say. Or what about this example here? H. pylori. It can cause stomach ulcers. I understand it used to be thought before this kind of discovery about this, that uh, stomach ulcers were just caused by stress. Not like I'm saying stress couldn't um, exacerbate them or couldn't be a contributing factor. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was, but it's also a bacteriological uh, problem. And so this can cause stomach ulcers, and that chemical there has been used as a treatment. How does it work? An enzyme made by normal H. pylori converts that into this other thing, which can kill H. pylori. In other words, the enzyme that it itself makes is necessary in order for this process to work. But some evolved resistance. How did they evolve resistance? Some of you might be able to see what's going to happen here. Bacteria that escape the chemical reaper 
often have genetic mutations. If the gene encoding the enzyme that acts on that drug or that chemical is damaged or destroyed, the bacterium becomes resistant to the drug. And so, as you can see, that's a beneficial mutation because it, of course, allowed the bacteria to survive, but it didn't add something. The way the uh, bacteria became resistant was by breaking its ability to make that enzyme. So the mutation broke the enzyme, and, and in this case, that was a beneficial thing. You know, if you have beetles on a windy island, as I think some have pointed out, if you have beetles on a windy island and they lose their ability to fly, that's going to be beneficial. But it was beneficial because they lost something, just like here. But you cannot get from a single-celled organism to, you know, eagles and dolphins and human beings by losing things. You've got to have the creation of new genetic information for eyes and hands and wings and things like that. So it appears that genetic information also was designed. Sanford says, information and complexity which surpass human understanding are programmed into a space smaller than an invisible speck of dust. Mutation selection cannot even begin to explain this. It should be very clear that our genome could not have arisen spontaneously. The only reasonable alternative to a spontaneous genome is a genome which arose by design. So this here that we recognize, Mount Rushmore, didn't happen by chance. It wasn't just a storm came through and left that. It was by design. Well, these didn't happen by chance either. And this is exactly what the scriptures tell us as well. Romans 1.20, for his, that is God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. In other words, just by looking at the things around us, we can tell the existence of God that he created just by looking at the things that are around us. Now, before concluding, I would like to mention that, you know, I think discussions of design and things like that are very interesting. I think it would be good for science to be more open to the possibility that some things are designed and uh, didn't happen by chance, a lot of things. But, of course, what's really important is the implications with regard to salvation. That there is a God, that God exists, and that he created, and that one day we are going to stand before the throne. And design can help us to recognize that God is real and to help us prepare for that day. You know, God loves everyone. He does not want anyone to be lost, the scriptures tell us. He wants every person to be saved. And while we're in this life, we have a choice about what destination we want. And so I'd like to describe what the scriptures say about how to be saved. Scriptures tell us that we need to believe that God exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. We have to repent of sins. Repentance involves a change of mind, turning away from sin, turning toward God that leads to a change of life. We have to confess our faith in Jesus. Some people say that you have to confess your sins, but that comes up later. Initially, to become a Christian, one has to confess one's faith in Jesus, that one believes that he is the one that he claimed to be. And then one must be baptized, immersed in water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that places us into Christ, enables, or that makes a person a Christian, but it's not as though one's ticket is punched for heaven and it doesn't matter what you do because one has to continue to live a faithful life, as the scriptures also say. Now, of course, sometimes we make mistakes. I'm not perfect. People aren't perfect. And so we mess up. We sin. We do wrong. Fortunately, though, there is a way to be forgiven for those as well. Christians, once people become a Christian, they can confess their sins and God will forgive. Now, I realize that some of you who might be listening to this might disagree. You, you 
might have uh, might believe that no what you do is you say a sinner's prayer or things of that nature and uh, I'm not doubting the sincerity of people who who say things like that but as we look through the scriptures we never see that we never see that happening as we look through and we see examples of conversion this pattern here believing repenting confessing being baptized that is the pattern that we see about how to become a Christian and so uh, I would encourage you to act accordingly. Thank you very much.